stories are the most powerful thing on earth. They are literally life and death. Wars are waged based on the story of who is the hero and who is the villain. You are the result of a story your parents told each other. The one night stand, the soulmate, and friends who became so much more. Life and death. So wouldn't you like to understand them better, these stories? How Story Works, an elegant guide to the crafts of storytelling by Lonnie Diane Rich, demystifies stories and helps you understand why you love what you love, why you hate what you hate, and why prologues are almost always a bad idea. How Story Works by Lonnie Diane Rich. Available on Amazon in ebook, audiobook, and paperback form. Get your copy today. Welcome to Still Pretty, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast from Chipperish Media. I'm film scholar and just another dirty girl, Noelle LaCroix. And I'm story expert who wrapped evil around her like a large evil Mexican serape, Lonnie Diane Rich. And we are here today to talk about Dirty Girls, the 18th episode of season seven. Dirty Girls aired on April 15th, 2003 and was written by Drew Goddard and directed by Michael Gershman. Still Pretty is a fully spoiled, full spectrum Buffy podcast. So if you haven't seen all of the show... Go take care of that, and we'll look for the Lord in the wrong damn places. Are you the bad slayer now? Am I the good slayer now? Then let's go on patrol. In Dirty Girls, a girl is being chased by bringers when a truck stops to pick her up. The driver is a priest, so the girl hops in and seems relieved until the priest starts saying this creepy shit. Oh, do you ever think that maybe they were chasing you because you were a whore? Oh, for fuck's sake. He tells her that the bringers are his boys and then burns her with a cigarette lighter, whispers something in her ear, stabs her in the gut, and tosses her out of the moving vehicle to the ground. The girl rolls as the priest's truck drives away and the car behind them skids to a stop. Willow runs to the girl's side while the camera pans to Willow's passenger and oh my hey girl hey it's Faith yep guess I'm back in Sunnydale at the hospital Faith makes the valid point that maybe they could have given her a heads up about someone trying to take out the Slayer line Willow apologizes and Faith shrugs it off she decides Buffy should know what's going on and heads out to the cemetery to find her on patrol in the cemetery, Faith comes upon Spike attacking a woman, and Faith jumps him. They trade punches for a bit, and then Buffy steps in and takes Spike's side. You're protecting vampires? Are you the bad slayer now? Am I the good slayer now? Buffy and Spike bring Faith up to date, and the innocent woman he was fighting puts on her vamp face and comes after Faith. Faith dispatches of the vamp, and finally, everyone's on the same page. Nice to have you back. Buffy takes Faith back to the Summer's house of Theseus, and everyone greets Faith with a distinctive lack of warmth. Buffy treats Giles with equal coldness. Spike takes Faith aside to explain that Giles and Buffy are fighting because Giles tried to have Spike killed, which does not comfort Faith, but doesn't surprise her much either. In a wine cellar, the priest, named Caleb, talks to the first, dressed as Buffy. She tells Caleb she's dressed as a slayer, and Caleb is amazed. He circles around her, dropping exposition at her feet that he was the one who organized the bringers and blew up the Watcher's Council. Next on his to-do list is dealing with Buffy, and the first wants to know how he can be so sure he'll get her to come find him. Curiosity. Woman's first sin. I offer her an apple. What can she do but take it? Back at the house, Andrew tells the potentials the story of Faith, evil slayer of the vampires. For years and years, or to be more accurate, months, Faith fought on the side of good. He tells the tale with enthusiasm, if not total accuracy, but whatever. Hashtag still cute. Meanwhile, Buffy goes to the school to find that half the kids aren't even there, and Robin Wood has news for her. She's fired. She needs to focus on getting ready for the war. Regular life has pretty much ceased for Sunnydale. Remember, Buffy, the mission's what matters. At the Summer's house, Faith and Spike bond in the basement, testing out their chemistry for a spinoff that sadly never happened. Buffy interrupts their flirt fest and is mildly jealous, but the potential Caleb stabbed in the beginning wakes up and they have to go to the hospital. Once everyone's there, the potential, named Shannon, fills everyone in on what happened, including the message for Buffy that Caleb whispered in her ear. He said, I have something of yours. Buffy gathers the potentials and the Scoobies in the living room and says she's done training and she's done preparing. He's got something in mind? 
Fine. I'm getting it back. And you guys are coming with me. The main Scoobies go off into another room to discuss, and no one thinks this is a good idea. Plus, it's clearly a trap. Buffy is adamant. She's in charge, and this is her call. Buffy and Faith go off to track a bringer back to central evil. While they walk, they talk about the potentials, the fight, Angel. When they're done catching up, they see the bringer go into a winery. I think we just found our hornet's nest. Let's get the cavalry. Back at the house, the potentials are preparing. Some of them are ready for battle, others are just scared. And many of them aren't all that confident in Buffy's plan. Xander gives them a pep talk about how great Buffy is and how much she cares, and Buffy walks in, ready for business. They go to the winery, and as expected, the bringers attack. They get the best of the bringers when Caleb walks in. He taunts Buffy for a bit, then punches her in the face and sends her flying across the room. Caleb tears through Buffy and the potentials, breaking Rona's arm and putting his thumb through Xander's eye. They run. That night, Buffy checks in on the injured at the hospital and at home, and then wanders the streets of Sunnydale, while Caleb tells first Buffy the story of what will happen next. You show up, they'll get in line, because they followed her. And all they have to do is take one more step, and I'll kill them all. She... I told you it had a happy ending. All right, Noel. So, oh my goodness, we had this realization in the pre-show where we're hanging out with uh, all the people who support Chipperish Media for $10 or more want to come to the live shows. Uh, we were talking about the fact that we have four episodes left of the right. show. Oh my gosh. <laughs> which is kind of amazing. And here we are already at Dirty Girls. What did you think of this episode? Oh my God, Faith. Faith is back. Oh, my God, Faith. Faith is back. <laughs> and Faith is almost a foil for Caleb, almost, but not mm -hmm. quite. Yeah. Um, I like that we get Faith and Caleb in the same episode because themes. Because <laughs> themes. There's a lot of fun stuff to play with there. And I think that is really interesting. Um, I love this episode because Faith, you know, and I hate it because Caleb. Caleb makes my skin crawl with every second that he's on screen. And that's the intent. Like, I get it. Um, but it's still, ugh, you know, just a little bit much and sometimes um, makes me really uncomfortable watching this episode. Um, but overall, I think this is a fairly well written, just really hard hard to handle episode in some places, especially when we get to the end, which of course we will talk about in a little bit. But first, we are going to start with our segment on world building and themes. And you've got some really interesting notes in the script here. Yeah, yeah. So I was interested in this, this fantasy moment, this dream fantasy mm -hmm. of Xander's and what the hell it's doing here. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, I think it's worth unpacking that Xander's dream follows the cold open and Caleb's rap about dirty girls and what they do to men. Yeah. I mean, to follow unquestionable manipulation and sadism with a quote unquote adorable Xander sexual fantasy is a fascinating bit of misogyny whiplash. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and are they not two sides of kind of the same coin? Well, I mean, yeah. isn't that, you know, I mean, I mean that's yeah. exactly. Well, as I was unpacking mm -hmm. this, I'm looking at like, what? Like, what is because I was for a minute for a split second. Mm -hmm. I was genuinely confused about yeah. what this mm -hmm. was doing here, just like narratively or thematically or whatever. But mm -hmm. Caleb talks about women as temptresses, um, mm -hmm. actually, specifically vaginas as tiny little hell mouths. And yeah. Then we get the opening credits. Mm -hmm. And then we go to an establishing shot of Xander's apartment that's like any other exterior establishing shot. In other words, yeah. there's no immediate indication that this is a dream. Mm -hmm. The sequence itself seems to say, well, but can you blame Xander? I mean, <laughs> look at him. <laughs> the... It's such a weird, it, it's weird, and I guess weird by which I mean actually not that weird, um, just choice that the fantasy dream exists in the story at this point because it establishes that there's a kernel of truth to everything Caleb says. I love that read. I think that's really interesting. I think, okay, I think it's extra textual. I don't think textually that is what they intended to do, but I think that that is what they ended up doing kind of by accident. Um, 
because the dream like here's the thing whenever i complain about how stupid this dream is and how much i fucking hate it the biggest pushback response i get is it's a dream xander can't control it people have dreams like that to which i have exactly two responses one fiction is not answerable to reality two this was written Xander in the fiction didn't choose this fine, but someone who wrote it or who was on the writing team or, as I suspect, might have been show running the whole goddamn thing, did actively choose this. It's objectifying. It's not narratively necessary. And it shows a grown man lusting after children. I hate it so much. And so the thing is, when you take it as something that kind of reinforces what Caleb says, I like that read better because it gives it a actual like narrative purpose here. I'm just not sure that that was the intent. I think that they thought it was cute and it was funny. And this is a boys will be boys moment. Well, I think that they do think that it's I think it is meant to be cute and funny and a boys Mm -hmm. will be boys moment. But it is meant to exist in the same world where... But really, it's it's about the women. Really, it's about yeah. how appealing these women are. It's kind of a... And how it's not Xander's fault and he can't help himself, yeah, right? Yeah. That, so it's not, it's not co-signing everything Caleb says, but he's mm-hmm. not... What makes Caleb scary... I mean, there's, there are a yeah. lot of things that make Caleb scary, but one of the things mm-hmm. that makes Caleb scary is how rooted he believes he is in the truth like capital Mm -hmm. t truth and this to me feels like the show yes anding that in a way to Mm -hmm. support him being scary like i think the show would not say well, women, you know, women are evil temptresses with hell mouths between their legs. But it would mm-hmm. say, oh, yes, but like women are ve- like women are here for lusting after like when let's not forget to objectify the women right after we get all this from Caleb. Yeah, it's like yeah. it it that was that was a decision. Like not only mm-hmm. was that written, but like that was filmed. Yeah. And that was this edited. is a decision. Yeah. 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 To quote. Hannah Gadsby. <laughs> that Absolutely. was a decision. Um, <laughs> and what makes me really want to tongue scrape my brain about all this mm-hmm. is that Faith goes on to co sign it. Yep. So Faith tells Spike, every guy's got some whack fantasy. Scratch the surface of any granola type dude, naughty nurses, and horny cheerleaders. It's mm-hmm. the locker room talk explanation. Right. Mm-hmm. And then she goes on to conclude, if you can't beat them, join them. Mm-hmm. So, OK, so Faith, <laughs> Faith finds power in leaning into her own inevitable objectification. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing about that. If people of marginalized genders and sexualities find power and pleasure in things that have historically oppressed us, great. I like consensual objectification as much as the next dirty girl. But Faith's (laughs) particular flavor of lean in sex positivity is infected with written by a man itis. A woman saying, well, actually, I like being objectified hits very differently when it's a man writing and a man directing. Yep. So we loop back to. You know, well, people have dreams like this. It's like, yeah, people absolutely do. But this was written. Mm -hmm. This was directed. exactly. And And you cannot forget that because you know that as a viewer, even if it's on a subconscious level, you know that this isn't just you're not watching reality. You're not watching somebody who is processing these things in real time. You are watching somebody who made a choice to write it this way and to co-sign it in a very particular way. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and speaking of a man directing in that that yeah. same scene with Faith and Spike, there's a shot that is so male gazy. It makes me physically uncomfortable. Like for mm-hmm. me, it's worse than the dream slow motion pillow fight. Yeah. When mm-hmm. Faith crosses the room to sit on the bed with Spike, she's framed from the collarbone to the hip bone for, in my opinion, significantly longer than necessary to make that transfer. I mean, there's mm-hmm. there's no reason to see any of her in close up in that moment. This could have easily been a longer shot of, look, mm-hmm. she is crossing the room to sit on the bed with Spike. Right. There's no reason 
absolutely no reason to focus on her isolated torso at that moment, except that she has just said, hey, cool, it's fine. I'm still the one with the power when I'm being objectified. Mm -hmm. I just like need to go detox now. Now, if we had done something with the fact that Faith has been stabbed in the abdomen by Buffy, and now we have Caleb, who's a serial killer who kills women by slicing them across the abdomen, who's talking to the first dressed as Buffy. But we don't do that. Like, there's no... We haven't acknowledged Faith's trauma of that at all. The fact that she was stabbed in the stomach, that she does have injuries there, you know, that she knows what that feels like. And then comes across a girl to whom this was done. You know, like this same thing that happened. It's the same injury, you know. So the idea that that would tweak something in Faith you know, is important. And I don't think that anybody thought about this from Faith's perspective. I don't think that we have thought about anything from Faith's perspective, except that one moment where she says to Willow, hey, somebody's killing off the Slayer line. A heads up would have been nice. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, So, yeah, uh, the the treatment of Faith is, I I think, disappointing is probably an understatement in that. Um, But there is a lot of really, really awesome stuff with Faith in this episode. And it makes me so, so glad to see her. But yeah, like that, that first what's happening is she's saying, I'm okay being objectified. Go ahead and objectify me. And the men are like, will do, mistress. But it's a man use like saying those words it's a man writing those words it's yeah. a man, like all of that is not about faith and it's not written for empowerment yeah. it's written for permission faith is a fascinating character in that regard because i think there are mm-hmm. some i i think there are some genuinely feminist and empowering things about faith but i also think yeah. that they're accidental i think that they're, yeah they're they are to me, to me, mm-hmm. faith feels like we have to do we have to subvert some of what we've done with Buffy. Mm-hmm. And Buffy is so rooted in capital G goodness for so long mm-hmm. that we right. have to make this bad girl. And, you mm-hmm. know, it's clunky. It's written by men you know, Mm -hmm. largely for men, but every now and then we'll sort of like back into some feminism with Faith Lane, which I do appreciate. No, this is the, I mean, honestly, a lot of the feminism in Buffy comes from the even a broken clock is right twice a day kind of phenomenon, Mm -hmm. right? You know, that like, because they're dealing with women and every now and again, they will allow a woman to be empowered accidentally. But the fact that they do all this, you know, stuff with, with Faith, where she is kind of reclaiming her body and how she uses it, when we go to completely actively objectify her in that moment, that's undermining all of that. Like whatever work you might have done that was okay in that gets completely undermined by the fact that we're like, <laughs> here are her boobs, you know? Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I find that to be incredibly disappointing while at the same time, really, really loving faith. Like I really, I love her in this episode. I love her in general. And I think it's really great. Um, the stuff in this, you know, story-wise, I was thinking about this idea of evil and character when we're dealing with Caleb, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, because Caleb is so incredibly disturbing and I experience him with an extreme amount of skin crawl, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, because I've faced misogyny like this. I worked under a news director once at a TV station who maybe wouldn't say exactly what Caleb says, but would say like close to it. And when you're in a room with somebody like that, it is dehumanizing and, and especially somebody with power, like it's just a really, really horrible experience. So, um, so I was thinking about like when we have evil characters and we talk a lot about what it means to, um, write evil things, having the story co-sign those evil things, when it's okay to have people be bad, all of this kind of stuff. Like we've been having these conversations all along. And I think the thing is, like, it is absolutely okay to write a character like Caleb. There is no problem with that. Um, 
But what we need is to show that the text doesn't rubber stamp those things, doesn't co-sign them as though they are not that bad, you know, um, or make them that they're just like so cute and so funny or whatever. And here, like Caleb is clearly evil. So indulging in his misogyny is an acceptable move because the text, I don't believe, does rubber stamp it like, oh, he's not so bad. Boys will be boys. I don't think we're getting any of that with Caleb. He is meant to be creepy. He is creepy. That is a success. Like, that's OK. Um, but since uh, quite a few times in the run of Buffy, we have seen misogyny and the patriarchy rubber stamped quite often in watered down versions from this, you know, like mm-hmm. less offensive, but still problematic things being rubber stamped especially this boys will be boys stuff i think what happens in the scene with xander's dream is is kind of nods toward that um you know it's kind of hard to trust the show because of that you know um the kind of stuff that caleb says is the kind of stuff most of us have heard from real people in real circumstances Mm -hmm. especially since the internet became a thing because man you hear it a lot more you know yeah um and it takes a toll on people who identify as women i think that it hurts us and for empathetic people who identify as anything it's going to hurt you know um and this is true of the showing of all kinds of darkness and characters like racist characters abusive characters rape violence all of it takes a toll all of it has a cost you know sometimes what's happening in the narrative is it's doing something with it that makes it worth that cost but you really need to as a writer take that into account it's not that you shouldn't write these characters and situations you absolutely should because we need to process it this stuff happens in the real world and we go to our fiction to process it and to understand it and to make meaning from it you know um But when, as a writer, you include these things in your story, you have to know that you are also taking on a responsibility to acknowledge and deal with that emotional cost um, and make sure that you pay that cost back by fully processing what it means. Um, And I think with Caleb, we do okay with this. Uh, But very, very often, we as writers fail to understand that we live in an abusive society and that most of us are traumatized by the things that we write about. Um, And so like my advice on this is not to not do it, but just be thoughtful about it. Be careful. I mean, it's okay to tread in this territory, but do it knowing that your audience is going to feel this deeply and make sure that the story you tell makes enough meaning to provide healing in that story. And and when I say that, like the healing doesn't come from the misogynist asshole getting split in half in the end, although that is delightful and I'm looking forward to that. Um, the healing comes from the acknowledgement, acknowledgement of what this is, why it's not OK, why people don't deserve to be treated this way, why victims of rape didn't deserve what happened to them, why their trauma is a natural response to being dehumanized, why they deserve to speak what happened to them and see justice done, why racism and homophobia on both a personal and a systemic level is hu- inhuman and cruel and its victims deserve care and love. Like this is our problem. It's not that we show these things, but sometimes I think we don't know that it's wrong or we don't know why it's wrong. We don't acknowledge those things. And we don't make sure that we pay for it with meaning, that we generate enough meaning from these things that we're talking about, that we we make create a fiction that can be healing for people as opposed to just re-traumatizing. Yeah. And I think what that looks like practically very Mm -hmm. often is just an awareness on the part of the writer, the director, the creative team, whomever, Mm -hmm. that there are people in your audience who have experienced these things. Mm -hmm. Like there are people in your audience, you know, I mean, I feel like we've all, we've all, you know, watched that content where you're watching and you think, oh, they're making this or that joke, but it has not occurred to them that there are queer people in the audience, or it has Mm -hmm. not occurred to them that there are survivors of sexual assault in the audience. Like you make, you make a joke or you make a plot point or, you know, something happens in the narrative and it's, it's, mm, it's so easy to forget that this is a fiction that you're crafting, Mm -hmm. or this is a performance that you're crafting. If it's based on something that has happened to you in your real life, um, But this is also the lived experience of people who are consuming Mm -hmm. your creation Um, Mm -hmm. and having that. So keeping that in mind with these story elements, mm -hmm. I think, is so, so crucial. It absolutely is. And again, it's not to say you can't do it, but do it with respect and generate enough meaning from having done it that you pay for it. 
you know, that you properly pay for what you've taken, you know, and I think that that's just important. Um, so, OK, that we started that like that was all inspired by the character of Caleb and my thoughts on how as a writer you write people like this, you know, and you acknowledge people like this, which is absolutely, totally like legit in fiction. Um, and you had some really interesting thoughts on Caleb. I am fascinated by Caleb. Mm -hmm. I I love characters like this. Yeah. So this is just like, this is just like party mix for me. I love Caleb. Um, <laughs> the opening of Dirty Girls is among mm -hmm. the scariest things on Buffy. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. the slow burn mm -hmm. pun kind of intended of <laughs> Caleb is so well done because we get that moment of relief with Shannon only to twist into deeper horror. Mm -hmm. um, and even when you know it's coming, he's yeah. genuinely kind seeming for a few mm -hmm. minutes. And then he starts speaking with a highly specific kind of conviction that yeah. many of the best villains share. Mm -hmm. He tells Shannon, you were born dirty, born without a soul, which is a hell mm -hmm. of a take, full stop. Right. But uh -huh. also, we don't talk about women's souls on this show, do we? I mean, Angel is cursed mm -hmm. with a soul. Spike goes and mm -hmm. gets a soul. And both of those stories are ultimately manly man-man stories about men being emotional man-creatures. Mm -hmm. Do women's souls ever come up when Dawn is grappling with being a key? Does she wonder about having a soul? Or was that something we talked about on Still Pretty like outside of what the show gives I think, us. Yeah, I think it was extra textual. I think for some, we've had some not really direct discussion of it, but nods toward it, toward it with Anya uh, when Anya was in mm. demon form. But even when Anya was in demon form, I mean, she was a demon when she killed all those frat boys and she felt it while she was a demon. So I am not entirely i mean again the soul canon in the buffy verse is wildly elastic you know it oh, changes yeah. form from you know from moment to moment um but it is my understanding that anya does seem to have a soul while she's doing all this stuff um and in you know in selfless as a demon she says take me kill me take it back you know, she is yeah. sorry that she's done it. So the idea of the soul being gone generally refers to, I mean, first of all, uh, uh, the vast majority of our vampires are male or male coded. Our demons are male or male coded, mm -hmm. you know, and we have some women, you know, we have like Sunday, you know, from mm -hmm. the beginning of season four. And, um, and so we have some of that, but yeah, like, I don't know that we've ever been clear but also the the you know here we have these men without souls these you know vampires without souls and then we give souls to Spike and Angel and even before Spike got his actual textual soul he had some of that because he was able to love yeah you know and and also the chip that kept him from he had some of the makings of soul stuff yeah um, you know because of that so um yeah, the discussion of the soul in Buffy is is definitely on really, really wobbly ground. Um, and especially though, you are absolutely right. We are not concerned with uh, with a feminine version of the soul and what that means. Yeah. It, I mean, Buffy has even, I mean, as we love to bring up over and over again, Buffy has died. Yeah. And there, you'd think that maybe, I mean, in our, in our, United States film and television mm -hmm. mythology that we're leaning into there, like that yeah. there would be some discussion of a soul or her soul. I don't remember any of that. And I don't know that, again, this is not something that I think they did in the writing, you know, with a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they're necessarily making a point here about the gendered nature of the soul on this show. <laughs> but I don't think so. I don't think anybody's thought about it. It's just, mm -hmm. it is one of those words because I think because it is such a heavy thing mm -hmm. in Angel's story, in Spike's story, in the overall mythology of vampires and how they work, that when Caleb says it here, I'm like, Rrr. like, I just, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, a little, wait a, wait a second. That's, that's an interesting that's an mm -hmm. interesting take. Um, but it works for me. 
I mean, yeah. Caleb works for me, I think, because he makes just enough sense. Mm-hmm. Like, he clearly has some very strong beliefs, mm-hmm. but they seem to make sense only to him. Like, there's, there's, mm-hmm. there is logic there, but it is Caleb logic. Right. And the scene of him reliving his interaction with one of his victims is such a great way to orient him among the handful of complicated men with dark pasts on this show. Right. But instead of disgust or regret, Caleb enjoys his trip down serial killer memory lane. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's so creepy. It's so delightful in a in a genre delight kind of way. Like he's such mm-hmm. a great villain. Um, yeah, he's also a special flavor of misogynist in the mm-hmm. all humans are dirty and corrupt, but women are the most dirtiest camp. <laughs> yeah, you know it's great. It's 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 that it's that uh, rhetorical nonsense that I think a lot of us have experienced in the like. Well, look, we're all human. We're all evil. We're all mm-hmm. corrupt, blah, blah, blah. Everyone does this, but you are more yeah. corrupt than I am for these reasons, or you are more whatever, mm-hmm. sinful, broken than I am for these reasons. When he tells his victim, you're human, you got your urges, woman's got hers, man's got his, our whole race can be so damnably weak. And that's why mm-hmm. we seek the strength, the power. And he's talking about words as power. And specifically Mm -hmm. his own words as power, which I think we'll get into when we talk about Caleb as narrator at the end Mm -hmm. and Caleb as storyteller. Um, Mm -hmm. But the moment where he relives killing this particular young woman is fascinating to me. Yeah. She Mm -hmm. literally follows him into the dark. There's a gasp. And then she falls to the floor back into the light. And if there were any question about what Caleb's so worked up about, it's spelled out here, right? Yeah. She's lying on the floor with her head on the left side of the frame, feet on the right. Because he's cut her across the abdomen, the gash and the blood radiating from it make a nice, vivid, bright red vulva shape in the middle of the screen, (laughs) just Mm -hmm. in case there was any confusion (laughs) about who this guy is, what his hangups are. (laughs) It's, Mm -hmm. I mean... It's so highly specific and so graphic, both visually and I think ideologically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'll say again, like, I think it's not a coincidence that in the previous Leon, we're reminded that Buffy stabbed Faith in the stomach. I mean, themes, everybody. Right. right? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, they're pulling that connection. They, They don't make it in the text. You know, where Faith would Not be enough. at all yeah. re-traumatized by, by young girls of the Slayer line. Also, hey, you might want to give a girl a heads up, which was kind of part of this thing with Faith, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're connecting this where, you know, are we in that way connecting Caleb to Buffy? Well, Caleb, I mean, Caleb is connected to Buffy mm-hmm. in that he's speaking to the first dressed as Buffy. Yeah. Which is a f- another fascinating dynamic. And he's, yeah. and she's, they have made her, hair and makeup have made her look so glamorous as the first. Yes. I love it. She's almost this, like, it's almost like they put the Jessica Rabbit filter on yeah. Buffy. <laughs> like the <laughs> giant hair, the like mm-hmm. Victoria's Secret angel hair. And then yeah. they're hitting her with, you know, all of this key light to just make her mm-hmm. look very blonde bombshell. Yeah. In a I am here to be sexually alluring kind of way mm-hmm. while Caleb is punishing women for having vulvas and also telling them that they're filthy for using the I don't it oh it's so I love it it's so gross yeah. and so great it is at the so same time terrible but you know and then like tearing yeah. new vulvas into them with a penetrating object like it's the more you think about it like the all the layers on this onion are just terrible and the more you peel the worse it gets yeah 
Yeah, well, mm-hmm. and just the fact that he is a man of faith or he's dressed yeah. as a man of faith. Mm-hmm. And then we have a character who is literally named Faith. Yeah. That And I mean, and, and Andrew gives us our definition and he includes the like yes. faith in the big, you know, the something, storyteller. Yeah, yeah, something you will fight and die for kind of way. And mm-hmm. the faith. I don't know. There's 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 Caleb's what mm-hmm. cost faith costume mm-hmm. and then there's yeah. there i mean this goes i think this goes way deeper than this episode explores mm-hmm. but it's yeah. also right there mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> is this an example of we did a thing we had some symbols and we used them and we forgot <laughs> that they also have like other associations in the world is that kind of that's my vote. What That's did, what I think. I mean, but I don't know. Yeah. Because yeah. it's there. It's there in the text. Like you pulling it is completely legit. But do I think that they really understood what they were working with, all the material they were working with? No, I don't think yeah. so. I don't think yeah. so. Because they didn't They didn't connect it. They laid it out there for us to find, but they didn't connect it themselves. Yeah. Um, Faith's return is, I think, one of the highlights of season seven. Um, Faith is, she comes in, she has her redemption story. Not that we got to see it. Right. The last time we saw her was five by five in sanctuary over an angel. We saw her turning herself in and going to jail. And then the next time we see her, they're busting her out over on angel again in in angel season four uh, to have her help angel while he is angelus. Um, And then suddenly she's here. Suddenly she's here. She's, you know, we have the discussion with Spike where, well, you could have left. And she was like, no, I was doing my time, you know? Yeah. And I I think that the respect that you have for that, that Faith was like, this is the thing. I did my time, but now people need me. So now I'm coming out. Also, someone tried to kill her because, you know, although nobody's going to really try to kill Faith because they're not ready to kill the Slayers yet. The plan was to kill all the potentials first and then kill the Slayers so that no potentials could be called. Yada, 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 yada. So all of that stuff, whatever. Um, But, but, you know, Faith's genuine hurt at being like, you could give a girl a heads up, you know? Um, And then one of the things with Faith, though, that I really love about her is that there are a lot of reasons why I could, I could be legit on Faith's side, being hurt, being Mm -hmm. angry, um, being offended, you know, with the way that she is treated. Um, And she lets everything go. She's like, whatever, moving Mm -hmm. on job to do, which on the one hand, I really respect. And on the other hand, I'm like, no Faith, you have a right to your feelings. Yeah. Yeah. That is one of those moments with faith that feels very genuine to me and that like, yeah, I know those people. I know mm-hmm. those people who are so used to being forgotten about or ignored yeah. that when someone says, you know, when Willow like Willow does the most halting attempt at an apology ever. Yeah, because she really I mean, I think I think in that moment, Willow truly is ashamed of yes. not thinking mm-hmm. of faith and assuming that she's safe in prison yeah. which mm-hmm. that's a whole can of worms that we're not going to open kittens, but right? yeah. you know but but willow i think is genuinely ashamed in that moment and faith mm-hmm. rather than do anything with that rather than have any feelings about that says forget it is cool i get by mm-hmm. right and it's so yeah. good it it feels so accurate and recognizable because she's so used to no one caring that even mm-hmm. Even if there is that little window of opportunity to like feel her feelings, she's like, "No, I'm good." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's great. Like I know yeah. those people. Like I know mm-hmm. those people who grew up with like nobody giving a shit about their feelings, and then when you do give a shit about their feelings, they're like, "No, I actually don't want to talk about it." And you're like, "It's uh, very okay. Like I love yes. you, but uh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> like, <laughs> we cannot talk about it if you want, but just like." All yeah. right. Like, yeah. I don't know. The the <laughs> the I don't have time for this with Faith yeah. is one of my favorite aspects of her character. Mm-hmm. And also advocating for herself and getting the hell out of the hospital. Just like yeah. very directly being like, listen, yeah. I had a bad experience with hospitals. I'm going to go to the cemetery. It's nicer there. 
<laughs> exactly. And I'm more comfortable there. And I think that that's really great. Like, there's a lot of things that I really, really love about Faith. What I, I dislike is the way that she is treated. Like, you know, when uh, she goes in, she sees Spike. She thinks Spike's bad. Spike thinks she's bad. They fight for a little bit. But Spike should know at this point. He should have been, like, brought up to date on it. I think that he was to a certain point where he was, like, you know, uh, knew that she was coming. Oh, let me explain myself to you. But she's too busy punching him in the face. So I like the faith and spike interactions here i feel like these two there's a reason why they would bond you know oh, yes um so that's really really fun uh, but then you know buffy comes in and buffy's all jealous and like oh are you two getting all cozy and whatnot and it's just the way that buffy is with faith I understand the last time she saw her was, you know, when Faith took over her body and there was all sorts of really, really bad violations there. Um, but Faith has been, you know, paying the cost for that. And then, you know, there's this nice moment where Buffy says, no, it is good to have you here, you know, and have another Slayer there who can understand that experience. Um, but yeah, it's it's. It's tough. I love Faith. I wish that people treated her with a little more respect. I wish that people were kinder to her. And um, and I, I really, honestly, I really like the way that Spike is with her. I like the way they are with each other. It's like these two people actually can understand each other. The two of them together, I think, is some of the best stuff yeah. in this episode. I mean, mm -hmm. even with Faith's like yeah, I'm cool with the objectification. I'm in, yeah. I'm still in charge. It's fine. Even with that, the two of them together, God, especially when they're fighting in yeah. the cemetery, when she punches him and then does this little, Eliza Deshku does this amazing little like finger stretch after she's <laughs> landed that first punch and you can see her being yeah. like, oh, that felt good. Like it's, oh, it's yeah. physical acting that always just like lights my whole heart mm -hmm. up. But the mm -hmm. two of them together, like they get it. They feel the yeah. same way about, mm -hmm. they feel the same way about feelings, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, you said it in the opening, like the spinoff that never happened, like truly... Mm -hmm truly yeah would have been amazing oh my god it would have been fantastic and, and those I don't two know actors why. specifically yeah. i they yeah. have so much chemistry so mm -hmm. much chemistry it's yeah and the characters wild. are written well for each other and i honestly do not know why faith was not immediately pulled into angel season five the way that spike was because that would have been amazing but it's a shame for the thing that never happened you know um but yeah it's it's incredible faith is incredible love her in this whole you know run from here to the to the end um but yeah she's she's really amazing um and of course now we have andrew telling the story of faith which i absolutely love doing dipping back into his narrativeitis but using it for good um and here's the thing like his stories are awesome when he's not using them to justify his own bullshit um you know when it's about telling the story which is the case i think with this bit about faith it's adorable and i say no flag on the play andrew because he's not using the narrativeitis to justify him doing terrible things, him murdering him all to like excuse his behavior. He's doing it to celebrate faith, even with her, you know, her lapses of morality and everything. He is still celebrating her in the way that he talks about her. And I dig it. I love that whole bit. Well, and Faith as a character is written specifically to delight Andrew, I think. Oh, yeah. Like, the yeah. way she fits. Part of what's so delightful about that, that mm -hmm. little, you know, replay of storyteller mm -hmm. is that faith herself slides so neatly into that world yeah. of storytelling mm -hmm. like she's mm -hmm. narrative as fuck so yeah. it's like it's perfect for andrew and then we get to end on that fantastic misunderstanding <laughs> why would faith kill a person who studies vulcans <laughs> <laughs> I love that they went for it. I love oh that they God. went. They didn't have to go quite so hard. And they did. Mm -hmm. And the misunderstanding. And you can see. You can see. I mean, God bless Tom Link. You can see the yeah. wheels turning in poor Andrew's yes. head. As Amanda's mm -hmm. like, no, he was a professor. He studied volcanoes. And Andrew's like, 
<laughs> okay. Like just okay. The, the dialing back mentally in that split <laughs> second. Adjusting, adjusting that narrative, you know, to, to keep that going. Um, it's it's really, really lovely. And I love that it is a celebration of faith for everything that she is. You know, yeah. he's like, she spent years and years, well, more accurately, months and months <laughs> fighting for good. <laughs> It's just, it's so great. And Tom Link is amazing. And seeing Faith celebrated, I got to say, felt really good. We yeah. needed that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Someone should be that. on Team Faith, really. Exactly. Exactly. Somebody should. Um, okay. So uh, circling back around to Xander, now that we've dealt with the terrible pillow fight nonsense and whatever. Um, the next time we really see Xander, you know, with any consequence is at the end um, when they're gearing up for this battle and he's tell he does this speech about Buffy. If you think that she's just in it for the kill, if you think she doesn't care about your lives, you know, um, then you're going into this with a disadvantage. And, yeah. um, and, you know, I love that scene. I love that Buffy walks in at the end of it. I, I'm not a fan of the, I overheard you saying a thing because it's usually used for false conflict, but this is actually used for Buffy hearing somebody she loves saying something really nice and lovely about her. Um, and that I thought was nice. Like, I liked that moment. And of course, this leads right into we all go, there's the big fight and Xander loses his eye, yeah. which is one of the most, I think, harrowing, horrifying moments in all of Buffy. And so nicely foreshadowed, right? Because he's coaching yeah. the potentials, brain, heart, eyes, everything's got eyes. Really nice. Everything's got eyes. Really, mm-hmm. really nicely foreshadowed. Yeah. Um, yeah. I it's, don't, it's, it's funny. a rough moment. I don't love the Xander speech partly because it, again, it feels like that we're trying to do all of the things with Xander all the time. So yeah, I hear that and I'm like, oh, here we go again. Mm-hmm. Um, so that doesn't work for me. But I do, I do love Xander going into battle with Buffy mm-hmm. at the end. I really love, yeah. you know, yeah, we're we're all gonna go and we're gonna do mm-hmm. this thing, and then he, you know he loses yep. an eye and it's a lot you know you're it the one is. who see- and caleb says you're the one who sees right mm-hmm. which i mean again i'm like uh, really like is that is true he? <laughs> does he yeah 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 but it is like yeah i think that you there's a really good argument for does he though but does also he, yeah. like that is the textual this is the textual stamp that we put on xander like this season we decided that xander is the one who sees that moment with dawn i sit yeah. back i watch you know all of that kind of yeah. stuff and i see what you are i saw what you did so we've got some evidence for that i think it is it is a little bit like um an ikea table that you put together with a lots of pieces left over at the end and you're like i don't know if this is gonna work um but you know but all right i'm in i'll sign on for that because i that it's my favorite version of xander so i'm in for that um but i think that you're absolutely right and like yeah did we use all the pieces really did we include all the pieces in building this because it's not that it's a little wobbly yeah yeah well and it is nice too to have somebody actually be on team buffy for real um Mm -hmm especially after the the awfulness of Giles last week to mm-hmm, transition mm-hmm. into you know i mean it's a little bit hashtag not all men but it's a nice mm-hmm. it's a nice nod to mm-hmm. no like buffy still is like this is still her show mm-hmm. <laughs> like yeah. this mm-hmm. is her still her show and she gets to run it and yeah. she actually does know what she's doing you guys so mm-hmm. come on now yeah yeah it is. Um, and, you know, and speaking of Buffy and like nobody being on her side and all of this weirdness, um, you know, this run and we're going to get into it next week when we go into I believe it's empty places. Um, it feels like Buffy is starting to function sort of as a conflict vending machine for the show. Um, you know, she's rude to Faith. She's jealous about Faith and Spike. She's pissy with Giles, although admittedly, like, I get why she's pissy with Giles. But it does seem like she is always, she's always yelling at the girls. She's always like, 
there's just always this sense of she is there to generate conflict and for a point for everybody to be irritated, you know, because Mm -hmm. she is um, fighting this war. You know, we have Rona asking questions about her, although I really do like when it comes to Rona. Rona's like, I came here for protection, Yeah, you know? And yeah, that is a legit perspective to look at that these girls found out that they were potential slayers. Somebody's trying to kill them. They don't have watchers. They don't know what the hell's going on. They're going to this place where they're told they'll be safe. And then a weapon shoved in their hands and somebody saying, yeah, you're going to die. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, that is a lot for a kid, you know, to deal with. Um, but we've got Buffy in this, you know... In this space where, like, for, I don't know, I would say a good chunk of season six and uh, most of season seven, Buffy is the last character that I write about when we do our scripts. Like, Buffy always feels like we're not really telling her story. We're telling a story that kind of revolves around her. And she is the the person sort of, at, she's like the central hub. Mm-hmm. But the interesting stuff is happening, you know, around her. Um, I feel like we lost her in season six. We never really got her back. Yeah. Well, she does shift into a different kind of protagonist role where Mm -hmm. instead of really following her and being kind of in her world Mm -hmm. and her inner world, we, we do the other kind of protagonist where the, Mm -hmm. the, the protagonist is basically an audience vehicle to Mm -hmm. the world around her. I feel like we're getting much more about everyone in Buffy's life. And Mm -hmm. Buffy is there to kind of give us a reason to interact with these people. But she's not, she doesn't feel very accessible to me. Yeah. I have a hard time. I have a hard time relating to her as a character Mm -hmm. in these later seasons. And I don't fully understand what that is. Yeah, she isn't, you know, she's the slayer and she's the one who has to do the fight. Um, But we had the season of depression, you know, which was season six in which um, in which she kind of withdrew. You know, she wasn't feeling things. She didn't want anything. Like one of the big things that makes us connect with a protagonist is that it is their desire for something is their longing for something that they don't have that provides the motive force for the story. And with Buffy, she hasn't wanted anything. She just does it because it's her job. It's her responsibility. But she doesn't want. I mean, when she was in high school, she wanted to be a normal girl, but she had to be the slayer. She Mm -hmm. wanted to be with Angel. You know, she wanted things. Um, And since season five, she hasn't. She hasn't wanted something. And that makes it difficult to connect with a protagonist who is not in pursuit of something that they want, that she's in pursuit of something that she is obligated to pursue, Mm -hmm. Uh, which I think is what, you know, saving the world once again feels like for Buffy. With, you know, momentary reprieves, like at the end of season six, where she says to Dawn, I don't want to protect you from the world. I want to show it to you. And then we have her training Dawn in the beginning. We completely lose that thread of, Mm -hmm. you know, I want to live in the world. And then Buffy ends up becoming just kind of a source of conflict without seeing her vulnerability and her desire and what it is that she actively, actively wants as opposed to what she is contractually bound to do. Yeah. I wonder if they wrote themselves into a little bit of a corner with her, too, with the Mm -hmm. moving her into a more adult space. Yeah. Because the high school narrative Mm -hmm. makes sense in a in a not subverting, but we're, Mm -hmm. you know, we're borrowing from the high school dramedy. Mm -hmm. And putting demons and vampires in. And then we get to this like entry into adulthood space, which Mm -hmm. in the world is hard for a lot of people. And it's almost like the show doesn't fully recover from that transition or doesn't. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know know that it does. I don't know if that's what's going on. But it, it is interesting to me that I'm noticing that I relate to Buffy less as we go on 
Because um, we're not dealing with her in pursuit of something that she wants. We're in, we're dealing with her in pursuit of something that she doesn't has want. the responsibility we're, to pursue. You know, yeah. so um, in season five, she wanted to save her sister. She was connected to her sister. It was all about her love for Dawn. So I think season five, I felt very connected to Buffy. Um, season six, we do get her "I Want" song. You know, in uh, "Once More with Feeling," I just want to feel alive. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, But her pursuit of that, I think we get in season six, but it is still kind of hard to connect with that. Um, And then it becomes about Willow. You know, it becomes about everything that that Willow's doing, which is actually the more pressing and interesting story. Um, You know, because Willow wants Tara back. Willow wants her life back. Willow is, you know, working toward that. And then, of course, Willow goes on a wild vengeance, you know, um, bender. Um, (laughs) So I think I think that that's where Buffy is difficult to connect with. So for the writers out there, that is definitely a lesson to be taken away from uh, from that. You want to make sure that your protagonist always wants something that is deeply personal to them yeah um and i'm not sure that um that we really get that with buffy in season seven well there's an interesting buffy moment in this episode that it's a it's kind of a tiny little moment Mm -hmm. um in some ways when caleb stabs molly yeah and then kicks her aside to fight with buffy Mm -hmm. there's this moment you can see Buffy in the, it's almost like Buffy suddenly reckoning in the moment with the fact that no, she really has to let some of these potentials die. Mm-hmm. Like not only can she not save them all, but you know, she's been talking all this time about how some of them are going to die. Mm-hmm. And now they're in a situation where yeah. some of them are going to die. And part mm-hmm. of her role is to let that happen because if she tries to save every one of them by fighting, she will die. And yes, then it's and Spike then who pulls her die. out of it and says, we got to go, right. which is interesting. Yeah. She's like right on the edge of, mm-hmm. I can't let this, I can't let this person kill any more potentials. Yeah. We have to, like, you can see kind of the glimmer mm-hmm. of like, we have to keep fighting and then right. Spike mm-hmm. is the one who's like, oh, we got to go. Like, we got to right. we got to run. Um, yeah. But it's it's kind of a barely there thing and not. Yeah. It's more it is. in the it's performance than moment. anything else. Yeah. But it is like, you know, we get these glimpses of of a Buffy in pursuit of something, you know, and we're going to see her. You know, definitely vulnerable, um, you know, when we get to the end of Empty Places and into Touch. Um, But yeah, it's 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 a rough ride connecting with Buffy. Um, All right. So here we are at the end of Dirty Girls. uh, And Noelle, what is your favorite part? I mean, I love the cold open. I love Shannon Mm -hmm. slowly realizing that she's in even more danger in the pickup truck Mm -hmm. than she was being chased by the bringers. But that is genre delight. Um, Mm -hmm. For (laughs) delight, delight, I got to go with Faith and Spike doing their I reformed before you bit. (laughs) Oh my God. Yeah. That is so good. Faith and Spike, every moment of Faith and Spike. But I say, like, my favorite part in this whole thing is everything Faith. Every time Faith was on the screen, I was into it. I loved it. Um, and she definitely brought the life to this episode for me. I just, I love her. All right. If you enjoyed this conversation, would like to join in, follow at Chipperish on Twitter and use the hashtag still pretty or as a Patreon supporter at any level, you can join the Chipperish Discord group and chat live with other listeners and the hosts. Hey, did you know we have a new podcast from Chipperish Media? It's called Endless and it covers the Sandman comics and TV show hosted by Lonnie and DC Comics editor Elisa Quitney. Search for Chipperish Endless in your podcast app of choice. Also, Patreon supporters who chip in at $10 and up get to attend show recordings live with chats before and after the show. So if you haven't pledged your support, now's the time. 
Speaking of supporters, this episode of Still Pretty was brought to you by the Chipperish media producers who support us on Patreon at the power producer level. These people are the reason why Still Pretty is coming to you free and ad-free right now. So thank you to Abby, Alice, Christina, Erica, Jonathan, Kevin, Kristen, Michael, Rose, Sarah, Shelley, Stephania, and Stephanie. And this week's special message for our power producers, there's nothing so bad it cannot be made better with a story. This episode of Still Pretty was edited by Chipperish content editor Jack Cram. Jack, I reformed way before you did. We will be back next time with Empty Places, the 19th episode of season 7. Until then, well, that makes me feel better about me. Worse about Giles. Kind of shaky about you. <laughs> <laughs>